Hi. Hello. In the last segment, based on chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes, we were looking at the misuse of the book to prove the doctrine of no afterlife. Uh, can you use the book of Ecclesiastes to prove anything dogmatically? Now, this comes back to the question of what is the intention of the book? What, what is the reason this book is here in the Bible? So its inspired in intention has something to do with the epistemology or the epistemological starting point of the book, which we'll get to in chapter 1 here. When we, when we think of this problem of epistemology, of course, we've certainly got to define what the word is. It's a branch of philosophy that deals with a very simple question. How do we know? How do we know anything? Mm -hmm. Not just how do we know the answers to religious questions. So, of course, you have to know how you know in order to, be, to make sure that you're learning properly. And in the book of Job, we saw a couple of segments back that there's a problem there already because you're dealing with at least five voices. Right. And God. And God's voice at the end of the book. In the New Testament, we've done segments on Luke and on Hebrews. Yes. Although we treat both of those books as if they're the inspired Word of God, we have to measure our vantage point looking back upon those books against the vantage point of Luke and the writer of Hebrews themselves. So yeah. check so out those segments if you the, want to know the more. The style of writing. The yeah. style and the sources. Yeah. What is the basis of authority according to Hebrews and especially Luke? The mm -hmm. first four verses you have Luke's own view of his own authority. And they seem to rely on eyewitness testimony as, as the authority behind what they're saying. Yeah. So uh, it's not thus saith the Lord like the Old Testament. Yeah. But this is what happened, these are the eyewitnesses, this is what they said, this is what they saw. Yeah, you don't find that phrase, thus, thus saith the Lord, very much at all in the New Testament, apart from the red letter sayings of Jesus. In the, yeah. And then it's him, not, not the Lord that he's referring to. Whereas in the Old Testament you have far more of that, and then we tend to re view the Old Testament's authority as prophetic authority, thus saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. Even the Psalms, and you know yeah. that from the abuse of the Psalms how mischievous that can get. Right, so like uh, you probably remember there was a time when the Watchtower used David's words, uh, I, I hate you with uh, godly hatred or something like, <laughs> like that. Uh, how does it go again? Uh, we must hate those who hate God. Yeah. How I hate those who hate you, David says in Psalm 139, yeah. one right. of his most famous psalms. And that was used by the Watchtower to legitimize the policy about disfellowshipping. Now is that a legitimate Christian position because it's in the Bible? So the Bible yeah. says, and the Watchtower has used it as yeah. a flat surface from which to derive what they want. hating? Because we're told also by Jesus to love your enemy. So there's a lot of things you have to uh, balance out and look at both text and in context. The nuances are very important. And even when you have a prophetic book that's explicitly prophetic, like the book of Jeremiah, let's say, mm -hmm. where you have many, thus saith Jehovah or the Lord. Mm -hmm. But then you also have all his rants and his uh, <laughs> upsets, you know, so where he's just being himself. He's just being yeah. human and uh, venting. <laughs> Check out some of the central chapters in Jeremiah and you see what we mean, where he's certainly not pretending to speak for God. Yeah. So we have to be very careful, and this comes back to the principle of 2 Timothy 2.15, where in the King James you have that phrase, rightly dividing the word of truth, where mm -hmm. past, Pastor Timothy is being encouraged by Paul to rightly divide, or modern translations say rightly handle, mm -hmm. handle properly the word of truth. Mm -hmm. So scripture is as, true. Yeah, it's not an, as black and white and cut and dry. So I guess the way to sum it up in a simple truism would be to say you have to use the Bible biblically mm -hmm. instead, of, instead, of, instead of an arsenal of proof text to prove whatever you want it to prove. Yeah. So that leads us back to the text where Kohaleth, that is the preacher, mm -hmm the writer of Ecclesiastes, presumably if you're a conservative, Solomon himself, actually tells you 
how he knows what he knows. His epistemology is laid out here in chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to read verses 1 to 11. The words of the congregator, the son of David, the king in Jerusalem. The greatest vanity, the congregator has said, the greatest vanity, everything is vanity. What profit does a man have in all his hard work at which he works hard under the sun? A generation is going and a generation is coming, but the earth is standing even to time indefinite. And the sun also has flashed forth, and the sun has set, and it is coming panting to its place, where it is going to flash forth. The wind is going to the south, and it is circling around to the north. Round and round it is continually circling, uh, the, and right back to its circlings the wind is returning. All the winter torrents are going forth to the sea, yet the sea itself is not full. To the place where the winter torrents are going forth, there they are returning so as to go forth. All things are wearisome. No one is able to speak of it. The eye is not satisfied at seeing, neither is the ear filled from hearing. That which has come to be, that is what will come to be. And that which has been done, that is what will be done. And so there is nothing new under the sun. Does anything exist of which one may say, See this, it is new? It has already had existence for time indefinite. What has come into existence is from time prior to us. There is no remembrance of people of former times, nor will there be of those also who will come to be later. There will prove to be no remembrance even of them among those who will come to be still later on. So here we have more truths stated quite dogmatically mm. by Koholeth. And among those truths, his theme truth, his central truth, seems to be verse 2. Vanity. It's all vanity. Everything is vain. This is very much in harmony with what he says in chapter 9, that mm -hmm. grab what pleasure you can while you can, because all the rest is meaningless. Yeah. Verse 8 is, is telling you that. It's all meaningless. Nothing satisfies it's, it's uh, all to naught, really. Mm -hmm. And you have a clue as to how he thinks that way, why he thinks that way in verses 3 and 8, I think. Uh, look at verse 3, for instance. What does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? So mm -hmm. it's by human labor he is evaluating life. It's by the fruit of his labor, both his experience, both experience of life plus is gathering of knowledge, which he gets to more explicitly in the next section, but mm -hmm. also in verse 8. Mm -hmm. His conclusions are based on what his eye has seen and what his ear has heard. Mm. And again, this comes back to human experience and us putting it together with our rational faculties, the sum total of our experience. Mm. And, and by the time he gets to verse 11, I find this very distressing, that this amounts to there is no remembrance of former things, mm. nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Yeah. That amounts to a total repudiation of of Judaism itself, because the yeah. Old Testament is... Steeped in history and remembrance. It's the only religion on earth at that point that was d embedded in history. Mm -hmm. uh, many have made the point, historians have made the point, that the Old Testament is the first effort to remember the past in a systematic and chronological sequence. Yeah. And yet here he's saying that, no, it cannot be. People are not only dead when they're dead, but they're forgotten. You can tell just from these 11 verses that he's depressed. Uh, you know, that he's, he's going through some kind of depression and everything seems useless and pointless to him. All things. In, in spite of the fact that he's got a lot, being Solomon. Being Solomon, he had every <laughs> opportunity. Chapter 2 lays that out for us, how he mm -hmm. indulged himself and made himself come to the reluctant conclusion that everything was meaningless. It didn't make him happy. 
didn't make him happy. So mm -hmm. we'll get into that more in the next segment, but I think... But it, we, we also said that he's, he's talking more like, like uh, um, you can compare him more to Stoicism or... Greek philosophy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's his... His, uh, his starting his point thinking. is more like Stoic philosophy in Greece mm -hmm. and or Epicurean philosophy in Greece, the two principal types of philosophy that Paul comes up against in Acts mm -hmm. chapter 17, but also Hinduism, yeah. fatalism. Yeah. And there's a lot of fatalism in Islam too, that <laughs> we're... <laughs> We're subject to vanity is more like those philosophies than it is like the Old Testament and mm -hmm. certainly like the New Testament. Yeah, so it is a, a big contrast to the way uh, Paul talks to people of that understanding. He gives them hope for one thing. He ends with hope. He doesn't say it's just useless and, and a circle, but that God has set plans and places and uh, he's much more the opposite. Even the setbacks of life, that is the cross aspect. So I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians mm -hmm. 1 where Paul plainly says, and he doesn't say the Greeks through their wisdom didn't get to know God. He says the world through its wisdom did not get to know God. And I would say that's, that's what we have here. These are the worldly methods Ecclesiastes mm -hmm. is talking about of getting to God. Mm -hmm. Figuring it out yourself mm -hmm. based on your experience and your rational faculties. So it's a repudiation. I think the very fact that the book is in the Bible is there God's repudiation of the normal way that human beings yeah. get get yeah. knowledge. In other words, human epistemology. Yeah. So God does need to reveal. Uh, we need revelation to really understand. Yeah, and we'll deal more with the explicit claim, that biographical claim of how Solomon Kohaleth went about this endeavor to understand the world without revelation in the next segment. Okay.